Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, whoops, wrong side, which is where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. NOAA Live webinars will be offered most Wednesdays during their school year at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And to find out when our next webinar is, you can visit our webpage or like us on Facebook, follow us on Facebook. This series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now today, it is my pleasure to be introducing you to one of my coworkers, Harriet Booth, from both Woods Hole Sea Grant and the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension in Barnstable, Massachusetts. Now, while we'll be talking about NOAA's role in shellfish farming, we wanna recognize that we are coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that both Harriet and our program are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. Now, a few guidelines, those of you that are regulars know these. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure that everyone can hear Harriet. However, the same box where you told me where you're from, you can write questions in. We encourage you to ask them as we go. I'll be keeping track for Harriet. She'll stop every now and then to answer a few. We might not get to all of your questions, but we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And just a quick shout out because we have Nina from Woodsville, Massachusetts, Joseph from Clarksville, Christy, um, and grade five from Hawaii. So welcome everyone. All right, enough of me talking. I'm gonna hand it over to Harriet. Oh, one last thing. I wanna just thank Crystal and Trisha who are our wonderful American Sign Language interpreters. So thank you for um, providing that service. All right, over to you, Harriet. Thanks, Grace. Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here. So today I am talking to you from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. So if you look down here in the corner, we have a map of the United States and I am over here on the very Eastern coast of the country. So here in yellow, um, Cape Cod is this peninsula that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean, right on the Eastern side of Massachusetts. So this is where I live and work and I am a marine scientist. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But first I wanted to tell you that I actually grew up all the way over here on the other side of the state. So I grew up nowhere near the ocean. I actually grew up in the middle of the woods. Um, I grew up on a farm and my family and I grew a lot of vegetables and plants and we raised a lot of animals. And I spent a lot of time outside in nature. Uh, this is actually a picture of me with three of my pigs. So this is when I was just a couple years older than you guys are now. Um, so because I spent so much time outside, that's why I became really interested in science. And eventually I translated that over into marine science specifically. But I just wanted to give you guys that reminder that even if you're not currently living near the ocean, or maybe you've never even seen or visited the ocean, um, if you're interested in uh, in studying the ocean, you can still do that. You can um, get a job working as a marine scientist or some other job working in the ocean. So these other two pictures are me uh, now at my current job. So here I just finished raking some clams and here I am in Barnstable Harbor on Cape Cod uh, working with some water quality instruments. So here on the Cape, I work for two groups. I work with Grace at Woods Hole Sea Grant and I work for uh, Barnstable County Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. And Barnstable County is just the 15 towns on Cape Cod. And my job for those two groups is uh, a marine resource specialist. And that really just means that I uh, conduct a lot of research and I answer questions about the various resources we have in our coastal uh, waters. They're all around Cape Cod. So that means I'm answering questions about the quality of the water, so how clean and healthy it is. I'm answering questions about shellfish and other organisms that live in our waters. And then I'm also uh, working with the people who use these resources and making sure that those people use them in a you know, valuable way, but that they also um, use them in a way that's healthy for the environment and sustainable for all of us. 
So before I go any further, I'm going to show you, um, we're gonna set up a little experiment, okay? So I'm gonna show you two tanks I have set up right here next to me. And what we're gonna do is set this up now because we need the rest of the webinar for the experiment to run. And then I'm gonna show you results at the end. So what we have here are two tanks of seawater. And I collected this seawater this morning from Barnstable Harbor. So it's the same water in both tanks. And then this tank, I started this experiment about an hour ago. And what I did was I put one and a half spoonfuls of cornstarch in this water. And that really, it's just this uh, white powder. It just makes the water um, white and kind of cloudy. And then I added 10 adult oysters. So you can kind of see them in there. And then what we're gonna do is do the exact same thing in this tank. And we're going to let them both sit for the rest of the webinar. And then we're going to check in on them at the end and see the differences between the water. And I'll explain what we're looking for in a minute, but we just have to get it started now. So I'm adding my uh, one and a half spoonfuls of cornstarch. So one and a half. Um, I'm going to mix this around. Make sure it's all dissolved. All right, get all the clumps out. All right, so you can see it's gotten all white and murky. All right. Now, I'm going to add <laughs> the same number of oysters. So they look like this, they're pretty big adult oysters. So one, two. All right. So they're all in there and you can't really see them because they're the water is so cloudy, but they're in there and we are going to um, see what the oysters do to how this water looks. So let's just sit, we're gonna let it sit there and we'll check back in in a, in a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the slideshow. So while you're going, this is Grace from the chat box. While you're going back, Harry, a question came in from Juan that I thought was um, something I would, I would answer while you're going back. Those oysters are alive. So, so to answer that question, the oysters that are in both tanks are living. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. And that is an important thing to know. <laughs> um, okay, so we just set up an experiment with oysters that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I wanna first hear about um, what you guys know about oysters. So if you could type some answers into the chat box and uh, Grace, would you mind reading some off? Of course, this is Grace from the chat box uh, reporting in. So again, the question that Harriet asked is, what do you know about oysters? So let's see, Connor says that I know that oysters filter the water. Juan mm -hmm. says we, we eat them and Texas says they're tasty. Mm -hmm. um, what else do you know? Let's see if we get a few more responses. Yeah, a couple more people. Michelle is saying they taste good. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions about them while we're gathering um, a little bit more information about oysters. Is that an average size, the ones that you put in? That, and, and, go ahead. I was going to say, that's a good question. These are big oysters. So these are um, the size that you could buy and eat oysters or bigger. So they're, um, they're at least three to four inches. So yeah, they're big adult oysters. Great. And I know you're going to get to this. So I'll just feed you this question as well as how do you know when you find one, whether it's alive or not. But just to finish up with what everyone's saying, um, Ashlyn is saying, um, let's see, Kelly is saying that they can make pearls. Sloan is sa saying they are used for many things. Joseph observes that they look like rocks. Liam mm -hmm. is saying seagulls like to eat them. And Eve is saying that they make pearls. So with that list, I'm going to hand it back to you, Harriet. All right. And yeah, those are all things that describe oysters. Um, so here we have all sorts of photos, but we have these three photos show oysters. So these oysters, you can see our, our their shells are closed. Um, here we have one oyster that's partially open. And we here we have the inside of an oyster. So what that soft um, internal tissue looks like. So oysters are one of four organisms in a group called bivalves. And the other three organisms in that group are over here. We have clams and we have scallops and we have mussels. 
they're all they all happen to be um, organisms that we like to eat. But what else do you think these four organisms have in common? Why are they all grouped together in the group bygones? So if you could write your answers in the in the chat box. Okay, this is great reporting from the chat box, and I'm just going to tell you all, because I know you're a savvy crew, that Harriet gave you a big clue by saying they're called bivalves. So what do oysters, clams, scallops, and mussels have in common? Let's see. Connor says they filter water. Sloan says they have hinges. Texas says, and Liam says they have shells. And Terry says they have two shells and is asking, where is the gooey duck? And correct me if I'm wrong, but the gooey duck is a type of clam. So when you were talking about clams, you have a quahog there, but you're using that as a general. There are a lot of different types of clams, right? Right. right. Um, yep, Shelly agrees. Bivalves mean two shells. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and Michelle agrees with that. And Juan says they can have babies. Uh, mm -hmm. And let's see, someone else I think said, Clara said they live in salt water. So I'm going to leave you leave you with that list. There you go, Harriet. So um, so all those most of those answers are correct. So um, but the the defining characteristic that groups these together, and a couple of you said this, are that they have two shells that are hinged together that they can open and close. And actually, the word bivalve means so bi means two, just like uh, your bicycle has two wheels, and then valve is two valves, two shells that are hinged together. So that is the definition of bivalves, but they also, of course, have a lot of other things in common. So I'm going to show you some shells I have here. Um, so we're going to talk about oysters. So you guys will know all about them by the end, but I do have um, this very large oyster here. But you can see, so they have a shell that can open and close. These are just shells. These are, these are not living shellfish. Um, now we have the scallop. So this is the second of the um, bivalve organisms. So a scallop looks like this. It has a rounder shell. Same thing, it has a shell that opens and closes. And um, a really fun fact about scallops is they look like they wouldn't move very well, but they actually can swim pretty fast and far. They use their shell to clap along through the water and they can actually swim. So that's a fun fact about scallops. Here we have our clam. And you were right, someone mentioned that they're all, there are many different types of clams, but they're grouped together. So we have, on the cake, we have razor clams, which look totally different. We have these, there are lots of different kinds. Um, but here we have the hard clam, and here on Cape Cod, we actually call this the quahog. So it just means clam. But same thing, it has a big, strong shell that can open and close. And then finally, we have the mussel. So, the mussel's a little smaller. There you go. Same thing. It has a hard protective shell. And, um, and mussels are pretty interesting because they're a pretty small animal, but they can produce a thread. That it's called the bissel thread. That's incredibly strong. And they use this to anchor themselves to rocks so that they stay in one place and are stable. So again, so the, um, the defining characteristic is that they all have these hard shells. And the purpose of that shell is to uh, protect them from predators and from things that uh, want to eat them. And it also you know, keeps their insides uh, the right temperature and, and all that. So before I go on, um, Grace, are there any other questions? So this is Grace from the chat box. And I have to say that Christy asks a question that I've heard a lot. And that is, why are they called shellfish when they're not really fish? Ah, that's a great question. So. I would, so they're not fish, but they, um, but they have shells and they do live in the water with fish. So I would focus more on the fact that they're called shellfish and, and that gives you a clue. Yeah, they're, they're not like other fish that we know, but they're, they're called shellfish because they have that hard shell that we just talked about. Excellent. And Juan asks, how did you get your job? Um, that's also a good question. Um, I got this job because I, um, I went to school for marine biology, I went to graduate school for marine biology, and then I actually had a couple other jobs where I worked with shellfish. I actually studied oysters in graduate school. So I had many research jobs where I focused on shellfish in our coastal waters. And so that allowed me to get this current job, which is doing exactly that here on Cape Cod. 
Great. And Connor asked an interesting question. Um, what happens if their hinges break off? I think Connor's wondering if, if that will um, prevent them from being able to open and close like you showed us. So what happens? Do you know? Yeah, so if if any shell on on a shellfish gets broken or the hinge breaks, it almost always means that animal will die because it means that a predator or something else can um, can get inside and and kill that animal. So they really they need their shell fully intact for them to stay alive. Great. Okay, I have one last question for you. So are lobsters and crabs considered shellfish? So they they're called so shellfish is kind of a common name. Um, it's not one of the specific names of a species. Um, shellfish or lobsters and crabs are in a group called crustaceans. So they're in a different group than bivalves. They're all in the same um, overarching group, but they um, they're called shellfish just because they also have a hard um, exoskeleton. Um, but they're in a different group than Great. Our it's sort of like calling something a bug, right? It's just sort of a common term for, for that. All right, I'm going to hold off. Um, okay, one, I, I'm gonna stop. One more question, because it's interesting. Michelle asks, are, are all bivalves edible? That's a good question. I, so that you can eat all of them, but we don't always want to eat all of them, I guess. So I'm trying to think of, I mean, we eat a lot of them. We eat razor clams. So yeah, I would say I can't think of any specifics right now, um, but there are probably some that we don't want to eat. <laughs> so that's a challenge I'm going to give to our listeners because I am stumped just like Harriet yeah. is. If you can find a shellfish, uh, if you can find a bivalve that we don't eat, let me know by the end of the webinar because that would be uh, that would be interesting. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand it back to you, Harriet, because I know you have a lot to share with us. All right. Thanks, Grace. So let's move on. So you now know what an oyster is. Um, so let's talk about now where oysters live. So I have two photos here. On the left, uh, we see these oysters are pretty much fully, they're almost fully under the water. They're sticking out a little bit, but they're pretty much under the water. And here on the right, these are all oysters. And I'm going to stop you, Harriet. Sorry, you need to share your screen with oh. us, please. There we go. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Okay, so like I was saying, here on the left, um, we have oysters that are pretty much under the water. And then here on the right, um, we have all these oysters are out of the water. They're actually completely dry. And so some oyster, oysters always want to live in the ocean. They want to live in salt water. But sometimes they can spend a lot of their time outside the water and they do just fine. They're still healthy. So in deeper water, oysters will be covered by the water all the time. And then in shallower water, uh, these oysters become exposed when, uh, when the tide goes down. So at low tide, they are exposed to air for several hours and they do just fine. What they do is they clamp up their shell. Uh, actually, here we go. We have an oyster, this is a living oyster. Um, let me make this, here we go. We have a living oyster right here and it's clamped up very tightly because you know he's out of water or she and, um, and doesn't want me to open it and, uh, and potentially hurt it. So it's alive, but it's clamped up very, very tightly. And that's how they survive out of the water. They, um, keep the moisture in their bodies and they regulate temperature by remaining very tightly closed. So oysters can live in the water, they can survive out of the water for sometimes up days, definitely hours. Um, so they're fairly hardy and healthy, they can survive in multiple environments. And now let's talk about how oysters reproduce. So maybe some of you already know this, uh, but I'm going to show you a little video because it's a little complicated. So here we go. So this video is called the oyster life cycle. And it's going to tell us the whole cycle from when oysters reproduce to when they grow up. So one thing to remember is that oysters, like many other animals, only reproduce at certain times of the year. So the word uh, spawn means reproduce. You'll see that that's a word we use for shellfish. So in the spring, the air and the water is warming up. And that warm water tells these adult oysters that it's time to release their eggs and sperm. It's time to reproduce. So they release their eggs and sperm directly into the water. So you can see in this video that it's mixing together, the, um, the eggs are fertilized and they create uh, what's called larvae. And these are just free swimming little particles. Um, they don't really look anything like what we think of 
when we think of an oyster. They're just swimming around the water here. They're very tiny. And they do that for about two days, one to two days. And then after that, they keep growing and uh, they've gotten a little bigger and they actually look like the letter D. And this is called the D stage of development. And then they keep swimming around, now looking a little bigger. And then after about three weeks, the, the larvae form a black spot and a little muscle that they use to attach uh, to a surface. So they sink down and they attach to adult oysters or to other shells on the bottom of the ocean. And once they attach to another oyster or to other shells, um, they are called a spat. So I'm going to stop this. Um, and at that point, when they attach themselves, uh, let's see. There we go. Um, at that point, when they attach themselves and they form their own little shell, they are called spats. So this is one of my favorite fun facts about oysters is that oyster babies at this stage are called spat. So it's a good thing to remember. Um, and you can see here, these are all little oyster babies that have settled. That's what's called when they sink down into the water, they settle onto this adult oyster shell. And he, here they've settled on these, the outside of these living oysters. So Grace, before I go on, are there any more questions? Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. And before I share with you any questions, I have to tell you that we have a few experts from the Milford lab on the line and they were um, kind enough to tell us two different species that are not edible. So Mark shared ribbed mussels, which I can't believe I forgot because you can find rib mussels and they, they do not taste good like the blue mussel you showed us. And Kristen shared that the crested oyster, we don't tend to eat either. So there are two examples of bivalves um, that we don't eat. There might be more out there. So thanks for um, looking that up for me. Now we got a question from Mrs. Herai's class. So I wanted to share that on, uh, share that with you. They were wondering if it's rare to find the big oysters that you put in that tank. Like it, what's the common size? Um, that's so it depends where you are and it depends uh, how many people are fishing for oysters. Um, so it's actually, I think it's most common to find, um, so here's an oyster. It's still pretty big, but it's a little smaller than the one I showed you before. This is a very large oyster. This is probably about four and a half inches long. This is about three inches. So this, this and a little smaller are probably the most common size and people like to harvest oysters when they're about three inches uh, big. So those sometimes you don't find. And it's also, it's hard to find um, the really tiny oysters because they're hard to see. So you can find a range of size, but generally a little smaller than what I showed you. Okay, great. And we got, um, we got another interesting question. And I, um, Joshua asks how oysters got their name. And I have to admit, Harry, I looked it up. If you don't know the answer to that, I'll share what I found. <laughs> yeah, so if you look at the Greek word that it comes from, um, that me it means hard shell. So I think it's it's oh. um, its name comes from from the root of, of oyster. All right, other questions that we have. Let's see. I have one more question for you, and that question is. Um, I think you kind of already answered this, but I would love for you to say it again. Ryan is wondering, do they live in brackish water in addition to salt water? And how long can they be out of the water? Oh, that's a good question. So, so yeah, so they live in um, areas that we kind of call estuaries. So they, they live in, um, it's very salty water, uh, but they can survive when the salinity is a little higher and also when it's a little lower. So brackish water is when that salinity is a little lower and there's some fresh water input. Um, so they have limits. They can't survive in, um, in totally fresh water, but they can, um, they can tolerate lower salinity if they need to. And they can survive out of water for, I mean, a couple days sometimes, as long as they're kept cool. Um, and then they're fine for, you know, anywhere from several hours to a day. <laughs> Great. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense because I've seen them exposed like that picture that you showed us. Mm -hmm. And Clara asks, do the spat stay attached to the older oysters for a while? So it, it also depends where they're living. So spat um, like to grow on oyster shell, um, but then they also, when they, if they break off or if they happen to settle somewhere um, where they're not firmly attached, they can survive fine on their own. So obviously 
Um, some of the oysters I put in the tanks were in pairs and clusters, but these oysters have been a single oyster for a while. So they, they just grew completely as a single oyster. Um, so they, they can survive fine when they're not in that cluster as well. Excellent. Okay, we have another question from um, Mrs. He Rai's class, and that's when people harvest wild oysters, is there a limit and are there specific sizes that you can harvest? Yeah, so the size is, the legal size is three inches. Um, so I don't actually have a measurement here, but uh, this is probably about three inches. Um, and then the, there is a limit. I don't know off the top of my head. I know um, in Barnstable today was the first day of oyster season. So it was very crowded down there. Um, but it's usually like a, a pet basket, um, depending on, you know, how many days. And then it depends how many days you can fish in a month or in a couple months. But that's a good and, thing to look at because it, it varies sometimes. Yes, and I will second what Harriet says. As a shellfish harvester myself, I love to go out and get scallops and quahogs and oysters. And when you get, you have to get a shellfish license. And when you get it, they will give you all of that information to show you what areas you can go to because there are specific areas as well as the sizes and how many you can take. So it's always a good idea to make sure you have the right permit and that you know those sizes. And um, I haven't been out oystering yet, but I'm gonna go soon. I heard it opened. Uh, open today. Okay, so there are a bunch of other questions. I'm going to um, I'm going to ask you one more before we move on. Carmen is wondering okay. how many years an oyster can live. That's a very cool question. So if they their natural life, they can actually live as long as 18 to 20 years. So not many of them do live that long, but if they don't get eaten by anything and they're in a an area that has a lot of food and good water quality, um, they can live for a long time and they can keep growing bigger and bigger. So many, many years. Great, well, I'm gonna hold, I know there are more questions. We're, we're fascinated by what you have to share with us, Harriet, but I'm gonna hold on to them and turn it back to you. Okay, so here we go. So now you know what an oyster is, um, you know uh, where they live, you know how they reproduce, and now one of the most important questions is what do oysters eat? And if you remember, the name of this talk is called Oysters, Nature's Vacuum Cleaner. And it's a little strange. We don't really, you know, what does vacuum cleaners have to do with oysters? Um, but here we go. On the left, we see someone vacuuming a carpet. And they are basically this clean white carpet um, has been, uh, the vacuum has sucked up all the dirt and all the particles. Um, that were making that carpet kind of brown and gross looking. So that vacuum has sucked up those particles, cleaned that carpet, and that's actually similar to what oysters do when they feed. So over here, you see a clump of oysters. There's a lot of oysters in here um, underwater, and you can see that the water surrounding those oysters is kind of green and murky looking. It's not very clear. And what oysters do is when they're hungry, they basically filter in, they pump in water, their surrounding water, and they filter, they use their gills to filter all the particles, little bits of algae out of that water, and that is their food source. So they digest that and then they pump out all the rest of the water. And of course, the water they pump out is cleaner than the water they pumped in because they removed those little algae particles. So in that way, they're somewhat similar to vacuum cleaners. Um, but yeah, it's very important to remember oysters are filter feeders, as some of you already knew. And another really interesting fact is that oysters, um, an adult oyster can filter a huge amount of water. They can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. And that's a huge amount, but if you think about it, this is um, one gallon of milk. And maybe you have a milk gallon in your fridge at home, but when you pick it up, it's pretty heavy. That's a lot of milk. And an adult oyster, so one, this size, this is a pretty big oyster, um, can filter 50 of those in one day. And they sometimes do this every day. So they filter a lot of water. And because they um, can clean that water by filtering out little particles of algae, and because they filter so much water, they can actually have quite a large impact on uh, the quality of our local coastal waters. So, um, and just to clarify, when I talk about water quality here, 
I am talking more about the natural growth, like algae in water, kind of what makes waters look green and murky. I'm not talking about contaminants or toxic um, pollutant materials or trash, nothing like that. So this is more just natural growth in the water. But a really important thing to know is that um, algae in some amounts is, you know, we need that in the water. A lot of plants and animals need that. But we as humans often, when we fertilize our lawns a lot, or when we don't uh, treat our sewage well enough, we actually create a lot of nitrogen that runs off into our local waters. And this is actually very harmful. It creates um, huge uh, blooms in algae. So it makes algae grow a ton. That's why sometimes you see green looking water. And when there's that much algae in the water, it can hurt other organisms. So a lot of plants and animals need, um, need clear, clean water. And so when we put too much fertilizer in waters, um, it can cause a problem. And oysters can help to some extent. They can filter that water, but they can't do it all. So it's an issue that we humans need to, uh, need to solve. We can't rely on the oysters. <laughs> um, so as part of my job, I study um, the local, the quality of the waters around Cape Cod. So here, this is an instrument that I use. And when I put this in different, uh, at different sites in the water, um, this collects data on the temperature of the water. It looks at the salinity, so how salty the water is. It tells me how much oxygen is in the water, which of course plants and animals need. Um, it tells me actually how much chlorophyll and that is the pigment in algae. So it tells me how much food is in the water that shellfish would eat. So, and it tells me other things, but those are the important ones. And this is me um, at my job wearing waders, uh, collecting data from one of these instruments. And if you look at this photo, this should remind you of our experiment. Um, and again, if you think about it, so oysters clean the water, right? They clean the algae out of the water. Um, and so if you put two tanks side by side, just like we did, this tank, you know, this is the same seawater. This tank is kind of cloudy and brown or green looking. This, and does not have oysters in it. This tank has oysters. And that water is almost completely clear. So it shows you those oysters, when they filter that water, it can really make a difference. And <clears throat> while they need, you know, they need algae in the water, but they can also clean algae out of the water quite a lot just by feeding them at their normal rates. Um, so let's, out of curiosity, let's check out our experiment right now, real quick. Um, so it's already, it's already changed a lot. Remember, this is the one that we started just a little while ago. This is the one that I started at about, about an hour and a half ago. It's almost completely clear already. This one's still kind of cloudy. So you can see they're already <laughs> filtering a lot of that water. And in about 15, 20 minutes, um, it'll probably look different again. So we'll check it one more time. Um, let's see. So, <clears throat> Grace, are there any more questions that have come up? This is Grace from the chat box. And yes, some interesting questions have come up. So I've been, I've been saving them. Um, a couple of quest questions about, um, so in, India asked how they filter, but instead of just answering that as a general thing, there were a few specific questions about filtering that I think will help to, to really answer that question. So one um, was a really interesting question that came in from um, Ashlyn. And Ashlyn says, how do they hold up to 50 gallons of water each day? So I thought by answering that, that might help clarify things. So they, they don't hold, they never at one point do they hold all that water inside them. What they do is they're constantly um, sucking the water in and then they have gills just like fish and those gills have little hairs on them called cilia and when they pump that water in their gills and that little hair draw the particles out and they they have them in their stomach and then they pump the rest of the water out. So they're not they're not holding all that water inside those two shells. They're just kind of, it's passing through. And then as it passes through, they're collecting uh, that food. So it's the, the 50 gallons is the amount of water that, that passes through an oyster in one day. Excellent, I knew you could, I knew you could, uh, no pun, well, pun intended, clear that up for us. Mm -hmm. um, so Juan is ask, asking, do baby oysters filter as well? Filter water? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they do, and they of course don't filter as much because they're smaller. 
Um, but that, that's what all oysters eat is those little algae bits in the water. Great, and there's a, uh, a great question from Joan and um, a very similar question from Linda. Do the oysters get sick if the water is polluted? And Joan says, how do I know the oyster is safe to eat? Same thing from Linda. Is it safe to eat oysters if they're filtering all that fertilizer? Yeah, so that, again, that's a really good question. So when an oyster filters only algae or you know, natural nitrogen products, um, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't make us sick. So eating an oyster um, should be safe in that way. But oysters can get diseases like any other animal or like humans. And sometimes you can't tell an oyster has a disease um, unless you test it, unless you actually take some tissue out and send it to a lab. So what we have, we, and we do have a lot of um, rules about when to harvest and, um, and, and making sure we're eating safe shellfish. So that's something where um, at certain times of the year, there's more disease in oysters and we don't eat oysters during those periods. So we, we have a lot of rules and uh, regulations that are set so that we can protect humans um, from getting sick from shellfish. And then oysters, um, they can get sick, but uh, generally in their filtering, they can, they can stay pretty hardy by, um, by filtering all those, all those pollutants and stuff out. Great, and I think, so Sam, let me know if that did not answer your question, but Sam was asking similar about how do we not eat all the things that they're taking out of the water? And I think Harriet just answered that. And I'll also just um, add in Harriet's being modest, but the extension staff does a great job of monitoring disease and giving that information to folks that are, are harvest, harvesting or growing um, shellfish, right? Isn't that one of the things you do? That is, yeah, we spend a lot of time <clears throat> monitoring yeah. for disease. Great. Okay. So I think um, I'm going to hold on to the other questions because I want to make sure you get a chance to um, share some other really interesting stuff with us, but don't worry. I've got more questions for you. Back to you, Harriet. All right. Thanks, Grace. All right. So moving on. So now we know uh, where oysters live, how they be produced, uh, what they eat. And now, of course, who eats oysters? So type a couple answers in there and Grace, let's see what people say. <clears throat> All right. Well, we talked about this is Grace from the chat box. We talked about us. Um, we talked about what oysters eat, and now it's what do what eats oysters. Sorry, I'm looking at the chat box at the same time. Okay, Connor <laughs> says humans and birds. Texas says us. Eve says sea otters. Juan guesses crabs. Nicole says me. Um, <laughs> Sloan thinks maybe octopus. Anthony's guessing maybe seals. Liam says, my mom does. Um, Ashlyn agrees with the birds. Uh, Sloan says, seagulls. Clara thinks maybe big fish. Um, mm -hmm. And Joshua's guessing maybe a sea star. So we've got a lot of different guesses, but I will tell you that there are a lot of people out there that must think they're pretty yummy because they're saying humans. <laughs> yeah. I'll, give you, I'll give it back to you, Harriet. OK, thank you. So yeah, so pretty much all those guesses are correct. A lot of different animals, including us, um, eat oysters and love oysters. So these are just a couple. Um, so we have crabs, but of course they have those big claws that can crush an oyster shell. And I will say that um, a lot of these predators, uh, they target the smaller oysters. Because if you think about an oyster this big, it has an incredible, that shell is like a rock. It's really hard and really strong. And so even, even a really big crab would have issues trying to crunch through that. So they like smaller oysters. So crabs eat them, fish with strong jaws can, can bite through an oyster. Um, like someone said, uh, lots of birds, seagulls eat oysters and other shellfish. Um, they'll either uh, break the shell with their beak or as many of you guys have probably seen, they'll pick up the oyster or the clam and they'll fly it over to an area that's rocky or the, a parking lot and they drop it. And then that causes the shell to break and then they eat it. And then we have things like little snails. Uh, these are called oyster drills. And they act, they're small, but they actually um, have a little body part called a radula. And they use that to drill a hole through an oyster shell. And it's a really small hole, but it's enough where they can, um, they can eat the oyster. They can digest it through that hole. And that, of course, kills the oyster. And this is a moon snail on the right. And they do the same thing. So this is a picture showing just that one little hole on this big oyster. That's from an oyster drill, and, um, and that oyster was killed because of that, and it was eaten. 
Um, so oyster drills are actually one of the biggest predators we have um, around here on oysters, even though they're, they're a very small, uh, small animal themselves. And of course, like you all said, humans love oysters. So, and you can eat oysters in many different ways. So I bet a lot of you have eaten oysters. Uh, you can eat them raw, you can eat them baked. Uh, a lot of people eat them in oyster stew or fried oysters. So um, we can eat them in many different ways and people generally find them delicious. So because we love eating oysters so much, we eat a lot of them. And there are a lot of oysters that just grow naturally that are out in nature, but there's not enough for how many we want to eat. So we have what's called aquaculture, which I'm sure some of you know about, but it basically means oyster farming and farming other animals that live in the water. So here we have um, some farmed oysters and they look like they're about ready for harvest. And we have someone here um, working on his oyster farm. So if you think about it, when you think about a farm, like the farm I grew up on, you think about a farm on land. So here we have lettuce growing in the soil. We have the rich soil that's good for those plants. We have cows that are um, grazing on grass that a farmer is raising for meat. And all these things are called agriculture, which is basically land farming. And aquaculture is the same thing, but it's farming in the water. And it's farming, of course, plants and animals that live in the water. So I already told you that you can grow shellfish, um, but what other kinds of things can you grow or raise in the water? Grace, can you read some answers? Of course. All right. This is Grace reporting from the chat box. So Harriet's question, she's talked about shellfish, but what other things might you be able to grow in the water? What other types of aquaculture? Uh, this is an interesting answer. I think these are some Cape Codders here. Even Sloan say cranberries. Um, Connor says maybe crabs. K Terry says uh, seaweed. Texas um, and Liam both say fish or fish farms. Linda, mm -hmm. another interesting response, um, says rice. And um, Juan is wondering if you can have a turtle farm, but I'm not sure that there's a big market for eating turtles. Um, maybe here you can tell us. William says eels. Eve mm -hmm. says um, clams and salmon. So we got some really, everybody had really great answers. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Harriet. I, I, that's a great list. <laughs> that, it, that's a lot more than I listed. But yeah, pretty, I think pretty much all those things you can farm. I don't know about the turtle farms, um, maybe in other parts of the country, but not, not around here. Um, but yeah, so the basic ones are big fish farms. We love eating fish, so we grow a lot of fish. These are some really big fish farms. Um, we grow seaweed, so not as many people know, but seaweed is delicious and it's really good for you. So um, this farmer has grown this seaweed on these long lines under the water and they just pulled them up to harvest that seaweed. And then of course we have shellfish farms. So this is a mussel farm. And again, they grow on these long vertical ropes um, and, and here we have some that have been harvested. And then we have our clams. Clams, of course, grow in the mud and sand. And then, um, and then we have our oysters. And um, as you know, so again, we love eating oysters. And um, because of that, we have a lot of oyster farms because we need to grow all those oysters to eat. And uh, Massachusetts is a pretty small state, but we have a lot of ocean. We have a lot of coastline. And um, because of that, we have over 300 shellfish farms um, on Cape Cod or in, in Massachusetts. And um, all, because, I mean, you can grow mussels, scallops, uh, clams, oysters, but here in Massachusetts, almost everyone wants to grow oysters. So 94% of shellfish aquaculture in Massachusetts is oysters. So that's a lot of oyster farms. And because we are farming so many oysters, and there's so many different farmers growing them, we have a couple different ways you can grow oysters and they all work equally well. So here is an oyster farm and this farm is using what's called bottom growing cages. And these are when you anchor bags or cages to, um, to the sand, to the sediment. And, um, and they stay there and you, you put oysters in there and when the water is covering them, they can feed and they grow. And then this farm, um, is intertidal, which means at low tide, um, these bags are uncovered. And as we learned, oysters are fine when they're out of the water 
as long as at high tide they are covered again. So this is low tide. Here's a bottom growing cage set up where they're under the water. And you can see these bags are pretty full of oysters. And then we have someone with a tray of oysters that look like they're about ready for harvest. <clears throat> and then we also have another kind of oyster farming uh, that uses floating cages. So this is another oyster farm. And these cages are floating on the surface of the water. And they are held up by these big floats. And these hold those cages just under the surface of the water. But these are oysters that are in the water all the time. Uh, so this is usually a little deeper water, and, and the farmer can access them, but these oysters stay in that water most of the time. So now, I mean, you guys seem to know lots about oysters, but if you wanted to start your own oyster farm, what kinds of things would you need to know in, in order to grow them and to be successful? Okay, this is Grace in the chat box, so I'm just going to... Um re-ask Harriet's question. Just like if you're a farmer and say you're growing corn and you might want to know certain things, certain conditions to make sure you can have a good harvest, what might you need to know if you were growing oysters? What sorts of information would you need to know to be a successful oyster grower? So let's see, Mrs. Um, I, he Rise class is saying water quality. Mm -hmm. And Joseph is saying maybe water pressure might be important. Michelle is also agreeing um, water quality. Connor is saying you would need to know how much current there is in a given area. And Joseph would said maybe you need to know the different if there are different types of oysters. So understanding which ones, what kind of oyster you're growing. Um, Ola says maybe you need to know how to grow your own algae to feed the oysters. Um, yeah. Texas says you need to know if they can survive where, you know, where you're hoping to grow them. So is it a good um, place? Um, Abigail says um, you need to know how far the tide goes out in, in yeah. the area where you're growing them. Kelly says you want to know the salinity or how much salt. And, and um, Abigail also says, well, this is interesting, will there be ice where you're trying to grow them? And William says maybe you want to know how many oysters you can farm in a given area. So... <laughs> I have to say, Harriet, that this is a very savvy crew. I am very no. impressed. You guys already know all of this. Um, so all those answers were great. So um, yeah, so you need to know what oysters eat. You need to know um, what kind of conditions they want to live in. So the quality of the water, um, the temperature, the salinity. Um, you need to know how oysters reproduce. Um, and you need to know, you know, who eats oysters. So we need to know how to protect our farmed oysters from predators. So, um, and many other things that you guys have mentioned too, you need to know, uh, you know, if there's a high current in the area or the tidal cycle. Um, but the cool thing is that we already kind of talked about a lot of the things that you need to know about oysters. So um, let's see, can you see my slides, Grace? Yes, we can. Yep, okay. perfect. Um, so, yeah, so, and that's basically, that's a really great part of my job is that um, I collect information like what we've talked about, um, how, you know, what oysters need, what other shellfish need to grow. And I um, share that information with people who are trying to make a living, like oyster farmers or shellfish harvesters. Um, so we work together on that. So this is a uh, photo of myself and my colleague Josh and we are um, setting up an experiment looking at how fast clams grow and we're working with this grower right here we're doing this experiment on his farm so we're working together to answer this question and then this farmer will use this information to know you know whether he wants to grow clams or not so it's a really fun job I get to do all this scientific research to find out all these you know, all the different things about shellfish and, and oyster growing. And then I get to help people who need that information. Uh, so uh, that is all I have for you today. But we, of course, need to check in on our experiments. So it's been about, uh, about 45 minutes since we've started um, this close one. So I hope you guys can see that. So here, this one is still a little cloudy. But this one, so two hours later, is absolutely clear. So you can see right through that tank. 
Um, do you guys see those differences? I hope so. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it shows you, it's a really great example of um, not only how fast oysters can filter, but, um, but what kind of huge impacts they can have on water quality and how clear water is. So of course, oysters are a really important species and animal in our environment. So I am happy to take any final questions. Grace, do we have any? We have a few, and I just need to tell you, Harriet, that people are saying yes, they can see that, and that's pretty cool. Sure. And I, I just want to say, Harriet and I chatted about this. If this, if you, if someone in your house got some oysters and you were going to have them for dinner, or maybe you had them in your fridge, if you wanted to try this experiment, it's something you could do in a little clear tank or a Tupperware if you wanted to try it out with some cornstarch, um, because you can certainly eat the oysters afterwards, right? Yes. Um, and, and Joan is asking, where is the cornstarch if the tank is clear? That's a great question. So that's exactly, so cornstarch is not what oysters would normally eat, but it also doesn't hurt them. But these oysters have filtered that cornstarch out of the water. So that cornstarch is now in the oyster's body. And the cool thing about oysters is when they pull something out of the water that they don't actually want to eat, then maybe it's not good for them. Um, they they can uh, they don't necessarily ingest it, but they turn it into something called pseudo feces, and it's just waste. So they can get rid of that in another form, and uh, and then it doesn't hurt them, but it's also you know not actual food for them. So they they have filtered that cornstarch out, but they're probably not actually going to use it as food. Great. Okay, so I have one more question for you because we're we're close to running out of well we're out of time, but I want to ask you this one last question. But I do want to just mention because Sh Michelle mentioned this in the chat box and reminded me that it is against the law in the United States to eat sea turtle. So I just wanted to circle back to that that in the United States we don't eat sea turtle. Um, it's under they're protected under the Endangered Species Act. So thank you for reminding me of that, Michelle. And the last question, because I know you have a great answer for this, Connor asks, is COVID-19 affecting your job? Yes, yes, COVID-19 I think is affecting pretty much everyone's jobs. Um, but I am, because I work outside a lot, I am able to still do a lot of that work. So I, I just make sure I do that work safely, I, but I do it alone. Um, and then if, you know, I'm working from home, like a lot of people, when I just have office work or when I'm just writing things. So, um, so it has affected me. I'm not in the office with all my coworkers. I miss that, but I am still able to do some of the field work and some of the work outside. Um, that's really important. Great. All right. So I have, there's so many more questions. People are so interested in this, but our time is up and we're a little bit over. So I just want to thank you, Harriet, for doing such a great job. I'm going to come back on screen. Thank you so much for being part of our NOAA Live series. Again, thank you, Tricia and Crystal, for doing a wonderful job of um, interpreting for us. I always love to see, um, show me again what oyster is, Tricia. Yes, there we go. There's the oyster. Um, so thank you very much. Just as a reminder, next week we will not have a NOAA Live because it's Veterans Day, but on Tuesday you can go to our NOAA Live Alaska, our sister program, and they're talking about tsunamis, and it's going to be really interesting. And in two weeks we'll be back on Wednesday, and we're taking you behind the scenes at the Milford Lab, so in Milford, Connecticut, and they're going to be talking some about aquaculture. Harriet, Harriet got us warmed up and prepped for Milford behind the scenes. We might see a shellfish spawning. We might see their algae library of, of um, I, I mean, I don't want to tell you too much, but it's going to be pretty exciting. So check out our website, and um, we'll see you either next week at the Alaska Tsunami Talk or in two weeks when we go behind the scenes at Milford. So thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, or if you're one of our West Coast uh, folks, have a great day, and we'll see you later. Thanks.